right now I'm going to take a big old dump on the ground and then I'm going to throw it at you. Welcome to the Plex. We do this show every Sunday, no matter what. 7 p.m. Pacific, right here on Twitch. That's twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. This is a listener-supported viewing and um, a viewer and listener-supported programming, whatever the fuck I was supposed to say there. And um, I don't know. Uh, you can support this program many different ways. Um, you can obviously monetize. We, we monetize through Twitch with um, subs and bits and gift subs and uh eplex.store for our merch and for memberships and also patreon.com slash echoplex for other memberships for those people who don't want to sign up for something new i'm producer dave and you can find me on grinder um in a little bit different zip code for the time being and uh this is what the people want i don't hate the cops 
And there's a person inside when the Trojan starts Oh, donate the cup Oh, when the Raiders come Who will protect the shops? Donate the cup They're a sensitive bunch If you don't stop throwing your rock Snap, crack, or pop It's the sound of a taser Your body drops Donate the cup Donate the cops, donate the cops Donate the cops Like your local police Cause they don't do nothing wrong Like your local police Got rid of the corruption And the racism been gone They've been keeping the peace Keeping homeless folks out of the parks and malls Got a cure for your social disease Follow the law, don't hate the cops 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 Our first story tonight actually goes back to election night, uh, and we're going to call this one uh, No Shit, Judy. This is uh, Judy Woodruff with the lukewarmest of possible takes. I think it's interesting, uh, since uh, he was talking it up when there was there were there was a moment there were there were weeks during the campaign in recent weeks when it looked like Kamala Harris might have some momentum. You hear more of that talk from uh, candidate from former President Trump then. So now does this suggest that he may be winning? He's feeling better, feeling more confident, as William was reporting. So he doesn't need to put those allegations out there, which, by the way, most of or all of which were unfounded. There was no evidence of any fraud. That any- all right. Great job, Judy Woodruff. Um, she's like, oh, if, if he starts to win, he's going to stop making these allegations of fraud. Yes, Judy. That is, a, that is what's going to happen. <laughs> You'll have to bear with me here. I'm trying to uh, manage uh, the system that I'm not used to and this very nice cat that I'm, slow, that I'm definitely getting used to. I like this cat. Um, up next, we got the potential incoming borders are uh, seems pretty incredible. And by that, I don't mean great. I mean incredible. Oh, um, hold on here. <laughs> God. Hey, everybody, this is a, if you're not, uh, if you're wondering on the podcast, is this live? Yeah, this is recorded live. <laughs> There we go. So here's the new uh, here's the new incoming potential uh, borders are. 
I've seen I've seen the, these, some of these Democratic governors say they're going to stand in the way. They're going they're going to make it hard for us. Well, I, I you know a suggestion. If yeah. you're not going to help us, get the hell out of the way. But we're going to do it. So if, if, if we can't get assistance from New York City, and, and I may have you know, we may have to double the number of agents we send to New York City because we're going to do the job. We're going to do the job without you or with you. But it's much easier to rest the bad guy. Like I just said, we're concentrating on public safety threats of human and, 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 and national security threats. Right. It's much easier to rest the bad guy in the jail. Give us access to Rikers Island that we've been kicked out of. Let us get the bad guy in the jail. It's safer for the alien. It's safer right. for the officer. It's safer for the community. But so if you don't release these bad guys in the, if you don't release these bad guys out in the community, then we're going to have to go find them. We're puts the officer at risk, puts the community at risk, and puts, you know, and bottom line is, it's, no one, sanctuary cities are sanctuaries for criminals. And, and, the, and <laughs> this guy's fucking terrible. This guy's gonna, this, this guy's gonna have power uh, going forward here. Seems, seems lovely that this guy's gonna have uh, some power. Um, this is there's a clown car. That's what the like the whole first part of this docket is tonight is like the the clown car of people that appear to be uh, nominated or going to be nominated for uh, cabinet positions. Up next, we got uh, Anna Navarro uh, has some thoughts on the uh, incoming border border czar. I don't like. I'm not a big fan of calling everybody czars, but that's maybe that's just my. That's just my my bias here, but here's uh, Anna Navarro. Maybe up here it goes. Look, Donald Trump won the electoral vote. He won. He's going to win the House. He won the Senate. For all effects and purposes, he's got the Supreme Court. They've given him yeah. immunity. This is what the country voted for. This is, you know, a lot of people thought that when he talked about mass deportations he wasn't being serious i don't know how many times he had to say it for people to realize he was being serious well if you thought he wasn't being serious the appointment of tom homan today as border czar and he will be in charge of a mass deportation program the largest the country has ever seen they say and now stephen miller as deputy chief of staff yeah. should let you know that he was absolutely serious and when you talk about mass deportations people think oh it's just going to be the, the the criminals there's not enough criminals uh, aliens in the federal prison system for it to be mass deportations. What it means is grandmothers. What it means is brothers and aunts. Yep. What it means is abuelos y abuelas. It means dreamers. It means your family members. It means your, your colleagues. It means your friends. It means people who are part of the society. And look, America, you know, those of you who voted for Trump, this is what you wanted. This is what you voted for. You screwed around and you're about to find out. <laughs> oh dude she just told the regular people she's like regular people you just fucked around and now you're about to find out i don't know i don't know if i like that that's mean but whatever it's not like we got a bunch of anna navarro stands in this chat who are being like hey don't don't talk shit on anna navarro um word on the street is that mike huckabee is the going to be the uh, ambassador to uh the u.s ambassador to israel um that also seems quite bad um and uh here's like what he sort of has to say about gaza and the west bank and stuff this is not this is not a joke folks my feeling personally, and I'm speaking only as a person, uh, I think uh, Israel would only be acting on the property it already owns. I think Israel uh, has title deed to Judea and Samaria. Uh, there are certain words I refuse to use. Uh, there is no such thing as a West Bank. It's Judea and Samaria. What the fuck? There's no such thing as a settlement. Their communities, their neighborhoods, their cities. Uh, there's no such thing as an occupation. That they get out of their minds that people are living in lean twos i'm sorry build israel great again what the fuck is this i'd seen this before anybody seen this is build israel great again thing this is new to me sleeping in cars circled around a tree They're living in very well designed and beautiful cities and communities can't wait to get back i'm going to take an extra hat i'm going to get it to uh to president-elect trump 
Build Israel Great Again. Oh, you did a shitty job on your hat. We may see him wear this out there in one of his rallies. Couldn't get a red hat, so you put like a red square on a white hat? I can only promise he will get a copy of the hat. Thank you very much. <laughs> fucking, fucking horrible. Fucking terrifying. Uh, I don't know what else to say about that. There is no such thing as these places because, like, is it, he was, oh, and he wanted to refer to them by, like, old timey, like, Old Testament kind of words. <sighs> this isn't great. This isn't great, man. I Red light cannot come soon enough tonight. Up next, um, so uh, tr I guess because uh, Donald Trump won the popular vote, I mean, uh, the bullshit spewed out by uh, RFK Jr. does not matter. And you, should, you shouldn't be worried about it. Because Donald Trump did, after all, win the popular vote. It's such a weird way, like, it doesn't matter if, like, if I won the popular vote, that doesn't mean that somebody else is in a dumbass. This is, this is all fucking wild that the scientific and medical community has been clear for years that what he says uh, about vaccines, childhood vaccines, is false. They don't cause autism. There's no direct link. Um, does that bother you at all? Look, Jake, on the, uh, in the election, Donald Trump won the popular vote. And one of the things that he promised on the campaign trail is to have a serious and thoughtful conversation about vaccines, especially after the pandemic. Mandatory vaccines is a topic that a lot of a lot of American voters want to. But there were no uh, mandatory vaccines on Capitol Hill. So I, I imagine this will be a, a big uh, topic of discussion in the confirmation hearings. But remember, it's Congress that makes policy and works with the president, President Trump, to carry out his agenda. And the secretary will be on hand to care, to execute that agenda. So I, I feel very comfortable with RFK Jr. having a significant seat at the table to lead uh, big debates about this at a time when obesity is so high, when, when health whoa we're gonna he's gonna what do you mean serious debates what is that the obesity being high doesn't have anything to do with vaccines although you never know you never know what these people might be claiming to be perfectly honest here uh, um up next we got uh apparently uh trump has uh, a pick for secretary of defense as well and uh this person this person um at one point was hucking soap in the shape of a grenade so that you can I don't know smell good and fucking blow shit up it was Pete Hagaseth everybody very likely to be the next secretary of defense a well-groomed militia being necessary to the security of a free state the right of the people to keep and bear arms while smelling great shall not be infringed I don't mind those tweaks you see, one man army loves the country and makes damn good soap. I've used them all, and I love these new brands. Like Gunsmoke, smells like American firepower. Or Gurkha, refined bourbon and tobacco leaf. Or how about Patriot and the pine... Oh, I'm sorry, why would, you want a, why would you want like a fucking a bar of soap that smells like whiskey and cigarettes? Bar, bar. There's more of them too. You can get them in a variety pack. Each of them shaped like a grenade. Soap not really. That's not really Every shaped like a grenade. This fourth that's shaped like a bar of soap. At grenadesoap.com. That was not shaped like a grenade. Not like a weapons expert, but that a grenade isn't shaped like that. That was shaped with a bar of soap with some fucking lines cut into it. It's probably so that you get less soap, right? Don't worry, everybody. You you may have one set of ideas about these people that we've, we're doing just a few videos uh, about here. But this is the main, like, it's actually like the Manhattan Project. And I don't know, they, they may act, this may actually lead to some sort of nuclear weapon exploding over a civilian population. So maybe this isn't wrong. Here's Vivek Ramaswamy. Look, part of what's holding back energy dominance in this country is that administrative state. Look at the regulations coming out of the Department of Interior, the slow permitting requirements, how hard it is to open a new refinery. So I think that is the root cause of our failure as a country, is this unelected fourth branch of government. And, and I think they look at elected officials as these cute little puppets that come and go every little while. 
Not anymore. There's a new sheriff in town. Donald Trump's the president. He has Wait, mandated uh, us there's cute puppets? That's not, I've never thought. I'm in Barack Obama kind of cute. Learnings of that first term. And you look, Elon and I, I mean, Elon's solving major problems of physics. I came from the world. Elon is not solving major. Elon is solving problems of how to like, how to like show somebody his dick on a plane and then offer to buy them a horse. It's not a natural problem. This is a man-made problem. And when you have a man-made problem, you better darn well have a man-made solution. That's what we're bringing to the table. We're assembling the brightest minds in the country. This is the equivalent of a modern Manhattan project to take on. I think the major problem holding our country back, it's the federal bureaucracy. Target that cost, right. save the money, restore self-governance. And Sean, will... I think we did something pretty novel here, if I may say so. If I just want to say is this government, Department of Government Efficiency, it is built with an end date. We want to be done by July 4th, 2026. So for the first time in- Done with what? America? A new government project that is designed to end when its work is complete. That's on the 250th anniversary of America's Declaration of Independence. And that's the gift we want to give this country on that birthday. Well, oh, fuck. What do, what do you- They want to be done? I don't understand what that means, but- they called it the Department of Government Efficiency because, because like, it's Dogecoin. Like, these... There's there's nothing... I, I can't... I'm having just a very hard time, like... I mean, expl even explaining this to myself, I'm having a hard time. I don't know how I'm supposed to explain this to other people. Like, what the fuck is going on? But don't worry, everybody. Not since the Founding Fathers, actually, have we had uh, a group of probably all men actually um like this group of people that's being assembled here or at least that's what uh we're about to be told on uh rob schmidt who the fuck is rob schmidt i don't even know who i'm like i've like lost track of all these fucking ghouls now there's too many of them they're like who the fuck is rob schmidt are these people are there more of them now or do we just are we like are we do we have tunnel vision because we know about all kinds of ex-scientologists and shit it is amazing to see the media circling the wagons to protect big pharma, big agriculture, and, and the agencies in our government that have so clearly been corrupted by them. Yeah. Look, Bobby Kennedy is an absolutely inspired choice for HHS, just like the rest of this cabinet. Every day, Rob, I wake up and it's like Christmas morning. Like, what, what kind of incredible pick are we going to yeah. get today to fund fundamentally transform America, but in a good way, not in the way that Obama <laughs> meant when he used that phrase. When, yeah, when Obama meant changed, he was black, so that wasn't people, cool. Making America healthy again, making America uh, strong again, making America great again. Every single cabinet pick that he has announced so far is incredibly accomplished and strong yeah. on their own. As a team, this really is a dream team. We have not seen this kind of talent pool since the founding fathers. <laughs> so my prediction, by the way, is within six months, I'm going to say a quarter of these people, Donald Trump is going to have called them idiots. I don't know. He's going to say, oh, they were stupid. They weren't, or because they'll just like to do even just the most minor of disloyal things, right? I'll tell him Ivanka's not an 11. Like, they'll do something. All these people will do something to piss off uh, Donald Trump. Like, if you watch, like, Eric Weinstein right now has been on Twitter just fucking riding Elon's or riding Trump's. And I wish Trump would appoint him to something for the fucking the fe a federal agency or something because. Uh, you know, uh, Trump is a bad person, but he is a person, and most people are annoyed to shit by Eric Weinstein and his his like little cast of "I'm smarter than you" characters. And I would love to see Donald Trump start being mean to Eric Weinstein. But the problem is, I don't know if he would stop there, right? Like, who knows what? Who knows where that would end? Up next, um, it looks like it's like because. As, as, as always happens, right there, you, you saw pundits going, oh, the Senate is a great deliberative body, and they're not going to appoint these people. Well, here's a couple of the GOPers from the Senate who are going to talk about their plans going forward, what they think is going to happen with the appointments of these uh, cabinet positions. We all learned that lesson that time is of the essence, and I think Ron and I and our 51 colleagues are equally committed to the same thing. You know, Senator Johnson, another um, very interesting and I think inspired cabinet choice was Pete Hegseth. Uh, of course, I know. Inspired to do what? Fuck. Inspired to start World War III? Very 
very well educated Princeton and Harvard, uh, distinguished um, military man with any number of bravery medals. Um, he wrote a great book called uh, War Against the Warriors. Uh, he wants to root out DEI and uh, CRT and so forth. He's concerned about the way the Defense Department's going. Now, that's going to be controversial, I guess, although anybody knows Hexeth knows he's qualified to run the Pentagon. What do you make of that, Senator Johnson? That's a breath of fresh air, it seems to me, also. Well, you used the term that I would apply to, to the people that President Trump is speaking, smart. These are highly intelligent people, and that's kind of the first criteria. Oh, God. Oh, we're so fucked. Like, our only hope here is that this group of people is as incompetent and, like, clout chasey. And just, just overall as hard to work with as the last group of people so that fucking everybody just doesn't get along and they all start fucking ratting each other out and shit. But I don't know if that's going to happen this time around. So now we're going to talk, we're going to shift to some local issues. And uh, here is from uh, the Rachel Maddow show, which, you know, it's the Rachel Maddow show. Rachel Maddow burned down her entire career to uh, give you every breaking moment of the, the investigation about Russia, including every time a Russian person in the United States farted. But this is um, the invisible co-director. His name is Ezra, Ezra Levin. And uh, everybody said here his message is pretty good, and I think that it's it's certainly not bad, and it's something that we do a little bit of around here on Tuesdays. In terms of the indivisible approach to organizing, um, I have to we have to go back in time now, Ezra, and I want to I want to ask you to sort of nutshell the indivisible philosophy to that kind of practical, locally based grassroots organizing that I described in the intro, um, yeah. how you developed it in in 2017 in the wake of Trump being elected the first time and whether or not that th that basic ethos still guides what you're doing today. Look, Trump wants to think that he's all powerful and he wants you and everybody else to think he's all powerful. But I, I'm sorry, Rachel, for the time being, at least we still live in a federated national democratic republic. And in that Democratic Republic, yes, we've got Congress and we've got 50 state republics where there are 19,000 villages and cities and towns and unincorporated areas where 335 million Americans live and vote for hundreds of thousands of elected officials. Every single drop of political power in this country flows from the people. Every single drop. This is not true. And it doesn't flow up to Donald it Trump. It flows from the people it who have money. The local level and the state level and the national level. But it's geographically based. So the key insight in the Indivisible Guide didn't come from us. It came from years and years of organizing on the left and the right. We saw the Tea Party do this. What they recommended folks do was focus on their local area, where they live, get folks together, organize them, and then focus on your elected officials, whether they're city elected officials, county elected officials, state elected officials, or federal elected officials. And in this moment, where you've got Donald Trump and what looks like a Republican trifecta coming after us using a slim election margin to justify a deeply unpopular policy agenda. In this moment, what we have the power to do is to organize locally and tell our elected officials, just say no, fight back. Do not give this guy power that he does not have. That's what we did in 2017 and 2018 to, as you said, to save Obamacare and also to build the largest midterm margins in the history of the Republic in 2018 and take back the House. So most of that was right. I think that like, especially like in, you know, places like the place we cover Shasta, it's super important to organize locally, even if you know the odds are against you, because those people that have done the organizing there have actually accomplished some pretty cool fucking stuff. And uh, that's that's pretty impressive, all things considered. Yeah, don't don't do what the Democrats usually do and like d just show up halfway and be like, look, we already met you halfway. Don't do that. So the reason that you want to stay organized locally, be it in your state or in your city, your county is people like uh, Oklahoma school superintendent uh, Ryan Walters. We got turned on to this guy by a viewer, uh, Kikyo, who I believe lives in Oklahoma. And this guy is a fucking problem. I'm excited to announce today that Oklahoma is the first state 
to bring the Bible back to the classroom. Today, we purchased over 500 Bibles that will be in the AP government classrooms across the state. Bible just like this. Uh, we have the Bible, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights. These are foundational documents in our nation's history. Our kids have to understand the role the Bible played in influencing American history. It's very clear that the radical left has driven the Bible out of the classroom, which leads to a lack of understanding of American history. We will not stop until we've brought the Bible back to every classroom in the state. But it's totally okay if there's a Bible in your classroom. I just like, what is, what is the Bible for? Like, is it there for educational purposes? Because I have no problem at all with there being Bibles in classrooms, among other books, possibly other religious books, other, other books that some people think are history. Like, no problem there, friends. But if it's, if it's being taught to students as a fact or as the only religion that is acceptable, which I think the, the, the former isn't really what we're looking at here as much as the latter, right? There, we're we're going to have kids being told that this is the only religion acceptable, that this is, you know, the religion of the United States and all this. And uh, they're, you know, they're not going to be really told much about uh, probably not the First Amendment, the Establishment Clause and Free Exercise of the First Amendment, they thought. That was important enough that they put that right at the beginning of the fucking rule book. But uh, I don't think we're. Yeah, I think that the idea here is to just impose Christianity on people, not necessarily to convert anybody, but to just teach the kids essentially that the school favors this religion. So you should favor this religion and maybe that you should uh, bully and fuck with the kids who don't have the same religion or you don't think have or you don't think have the same religion. I think that's what's going to happen. It's going to be fucked. It's not going to be fucked in like the big cities, but in uh, most of Oklahoma ain't the big cities. And in fact, Oklahoma is one of those places where the big cities are at the behest of the will of the people outside of the cities. It's not like California. They don't have Los Angeles County, right? Where 10 million fucking people live and can swing uh, statewide elections. Oh, here's another thing we should be worried about. Here's another reason you might want to get stay organized locally. I am totally supportive in creating a great place for everybody, but I just think we have to be cautious that it's not going to violate religious freedoms and freedom of speech. Um, an example of a violation of freedom of speech, I recently learned from one of my kids in high school that a word that I regularly use that I think is a regular word is apparently on the don't use list. So I learned that from my high school ch uh, children, which is the word retard. Um, retard means slow. It's in the dictionary. It literally. Well, no, no, no. Word. You're. No. I mean, there are where you could use where, where like, sure, like a fire retardant. Okay. Well, we're not thinking anybody's being insulted, right? Nobody's calling the fire a name. Yeah, we use that. That's fine. It slows the fire, but that's not, that's not what we use when we. That's not what people mean when they use that word referring to other other people. And slows down fires. Um, yeah. And I did not and I did not realize. No, you cannot control my speech, Mr. Rafael. So you cannot. I can use the word retard. OK, so this is one of those violations of freedom of speech that really concern me. So I really think there needs to be a lot more caution placed on specific parameters so that you respect those other constitutional rights. Thank you. We're not telling you that you can't say that on the street, right? We're telling you that the, the, the faculty of the school has decided they don't want the fucking kids calling each other the R slur. Like, we don't, you know, a lot of stuff. Like, you give up a lot of your rights when you're a public school student. It's not, you give up, yeah, you give up some rights when you're on campus. And one of them is like the same kind of freedom of speech that you might have off campus, but that's not going to, that doesn't mean you can't go off campus and be an asshole. Oh, here's the last reason. And the most important reason, actually, that maybe you should be active in your local community and uh, try to try to help out people and keep an eye on what's going on. Because things like this happen in Columbus, Ohio. Flipping tonight at 11. Hatred on display just hours ago in Columbus. A group of swastika-toting masked men marching through the short north, yelling racial slurs with a megaphone. The incident all caught on camera by our 10 TV viewers. Tonight, community leaders are condemning the hate. Governor Mike DeWine denouncing the group, saying there is no place in this state for hate, bigotry, anti-Semitism, 
or violence. I'm sorry, does he know that he's the governor of Ohio? Mayor Andrew Genther and City Attorney Zach Klein echoing that sentiment. City Council President Shannon Harden writing, the president-elect has emboldened the group. Now, 10TV's Carla Rogner is live for us with more on the community's response to that incident tonight. Carla. Yeah, Colin, just like our community leaders, community members were disappointed and shocked to see neo-Nazis in their own neighborhoods. It all unfolded just as another group in North Columbus was holding an event to combat racism. A Saturday afternoon interrupted by hate. Dwight Holland and his friend Dante Bell were enjoying the Ohio State game when they started hearing loud racial slurs coming from High Street. They walked past our block and all we heard was hate killed goat. Like for real, y'all came out here like that. They got their phones out. So I don't think in this context it's good. It's right that the news bleeps that out. I think when you're describing what someone else said in, in this sort of context, I think it's important that the news not bleep that out. Members of the group yelled slurs at them. Well, y'all hiding y'all's faces. Holland yelled back, asking the neo-Nazis to take their masks off and show themselves. What made you want to do that? Well, most of them are cowards. You know, they don't want to show their faces like the KKK, they wear the hoods and whatnot. But I mean, it's like I said, it's 2024. They say this hatred has no place in their city. You know, you don't deserve to be on the streets with the whole racial bigotry. It's time to be real. We're in 2024. Come on, how many years do we got to go through this? Uh, forever, sir, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Sophia Pierre Luce learned about the neo Nazis' march while taking part in a Haitian festival organized with intention to quell hatred and racism. But it seems like it's not because I just found out just now that um, they have the group of people walking the streets. She she immigrated to the U.S. as a teenager and has been horrified to witness the hateful rhetoric about Haitian migrants in Springfield that made headlines during the election cycle. We are here. We've been here years ago. There was nothing before. Everyone was working the same places, eating the same restaurant, doing everything. So why going back? Why are we going to start something that was not before? This festival meant to be a safe space to celebrate culture. Pierre Luce with the food there was bomb. Bell and calling for an end to hate of all kinds. I just want us to all be peaceful. Now is the time that we should unite as one in the community and also um, try to know who we are. <laughs> Police did end up confronting that group of neo-Nazis over on Goodale Street, but they tell us that no one was arrested. They also tell us that no one was injured. In Mayor Ginther's statement, he mentions that he will work with the Columbus Police Department to continue to monitor the situation. Reporting in Columbus, Carla Rogner, 10TV News. So these people, unfortunately, there's no carve-outs in the First Amendment for this kind of stuff. So... These people have a right to do it. Um, you know, if somebody says, oh, I don't like what you say, but I would I would die protecting your right to say it. In this case, uh, I mean, you have every right to say what you, you think you want to say, but I would, I, would, I would not stub my toe. Um, protecting your right to do that shit. Fuck that. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, my, um, my eyebrow, my eyebrow is a little itchy. I, I can't, I can't, I can't get with you. I can't, I can't protect your rights today. So everybody stay, stay active locally. Um, if you find out something like this is going on in your community, make sure you spread the word immediately. Um, cause there are famous incidents where, uh, people showed up to do this and they were, um, given a certain kind of welcome by the community. And, um, you know, we may all have uh, different views on that, but that's things, that's something that's happened in the past. So a lot of, I'm not even sure that it's right to call it analysis. A lot of like pontification, I think is a better word. After the election is like, oh, the Democrats went too woke. The Democrats went too woke. And, you know, it was maybe not a coin toss that Jon Stewart was going to do that, but there was a chance that he was going to do it. Um, oh, that's not what he did. This isn't forever, but it's going to feel like forever. Um, <clears throat> this is good. I, I'm kind of glad Jon Stewart is back. It just kind of sucks that he sort of felt like he had to come back. So I don't know if you've seen interviews with him about his like return to the the, the political discussion. He, he clearly did not want to. He said so. He like doesn't live in New York anymore. He lives like out in the middle of nowhere. 
He just wanted to fucking retire with all that money he has. And boy, howdy, did he collect a lot of money. Friends, he ain't doing this for the money, let me tell you. And um, I think he kind of came in sort of like buying into some of this kind of anti-woke stuff. Because there were a couple of like missteps where he was talking about stuff in like a way that we that I thought was framed and not necessarily in a right wing way, but in a way that was like sort of dishonestly sort of both sides, if that makes sense on issues that aren't like both sides. But he uh, quit that real quick after being around a little bit, probably did this amazing thing that, that most people in media are really bad at. Maybe he listened to the criticisms. <laughs> that people were giving about his work that that could be it but that would be fucking crazy for someone to listen to the criticisms that were leveled at their work <clears throat> up next all the while this was going on there michael schellenberger in congress talking about fucking aliens there are rumors that have come up to the Hill um, of a secretive project within the Department of Defense involving uh, the manipulation of human genetics with what is described as non-human genetic material, potentially for the enhancement. Oh, I remember he called it non-human biologics, which could be a plant. Of human capabilities, hybrids. Are any of you familiar with that? Yes or no? <laughs> I am not, ma'am. I'm not. No, ma'am. Oh, even those people, even Michael Schellenberger was like hybrids. He's like, what is this fucking X Files? Like, you don't look like Scully to me. And um, up next, we got, we didn't really have a palate cleanser this week, but we got something kind of interesting that I found. There was a, there's a song that, um, that we play sometimes. It usually just plays on the auto DJ. It's by a friend of the show, Phil Johnson. And he has a, a show called, he has a song called um, Designer Babies. He says, I'm going to get me a designer baby, no butthole. Well, there are in fact designer babies happening now. And um, this isn't great because it's from South Africa. This is where, this is where you'll, you'll hear, you'll hear from the story. Not great. <laughs> Shifting focus now to South Africa, it has paved the way for creating what are being called designer babies. I know the term might sound bizarre, but here's what this is about. In the month of May, South Africa announced a change to its national health research guidelines. This change, basically, may allow the country to become the first to support genome editing for creating genetically modified children. This could be a big development in genetic modification. Ooh. Now, editing human genes that can be passed on has always been a controversial topic. Anybody? Anybody? Uh, one, two, three. Eugenics. Many worry about its social effects and the risks involved. Experts say that the surprising decision by South Africa... I see Chad is skeptical, as research, you should be. ...raises important questions about fairness in genetics. About the risk of discrimination and how changing human genes may impact society. The debate about gene editing heated up in 2018 when it was reported that a Chinese scientist created the first gene-edited babies using... CRISPR technology, CRI. Yeah, but that story, I don't think that story was true. For the unworst, it is basically a technology that allows scientists to change an organism's DNA. It stands for clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. Sounds like a backronym where they wanted to call it CRISPR and then just had to work backwards. The technology is basically based on a natural defense system used by bacteria to fight off viruses and other invaders. It has many potential applications, including gene therapy. The Chinese scientists reports say aim to give the gene-edited babies resistance to HIV, the virus that, cause, that causes AIDS. And by the time this was revealed, twin girls had already been born and a third child followed a year later. Was it successful? What were the long-term health effects for these children? I have the feeling that we're not going to learn, was it successful, and what are the long-term effects uh, from this video? Did they experience any negative outcome from the gene editing? We don't know. The entire case 
remains shrouded in secrecy as per reports the announcement of the gene edited babies sparked a strong backlash critics raised serious ethical concerns about changing the genetics of future generations they argued that modifying embryos should have strict limits because it basically raises important questions about how traits are passed down naturally in fact many noted that the reasons given for gene editing were weak since safe and effective ways already exist to prevent genetic diseases and this made the need for such an extreme approach seem unnecessary and flawed not just that the scientists secretive methods and lack of public engagement were seen secretive as methods and lies this is eric weinstein i unified physics by my cell phone and fucking back of a napkin in my spare time while i was working for peter teal right that's like there's a little of this going on here what do you mean secretive methods oh we're able to fucking make you a designer baby that doesn't poop or pee because it doesn't have a butthole and um we're not going to tell you how we did it considering the potential long term impact of this research public involvement and transparency are important in any scientific work that could have significant effects on the society perhaps that's why there has been outcry and backlash over south africa's decision to change the medical research guidelines south africa's updated ethics guidelines for health research now specifically address research that could result in gene edited babies just to be clear here it also lists important criteria that must be met these criteria include having a scientific and medical reason ensuring transparency and consent strict yeah but transparency and consent you didn't you just say that somebody said they were doing this but that they weren't telling you how that they had secretive methods ethical evaluation safety and effectiveness assessments long term outcome monitoring and of course following legal requirements all these criteria sound good but they are less strict than those in world health organization's guidelines and naturally it raises concern about how well future generations are protected as gene editing in human beings becomes more possible the south african national health act of 2004 clearly bans reproductive cloning and any genetic manipulation for that purpose including human uh, embryos but when this law was made the technology to modify human embryos did not exist which is why yeah, this sucks i'm with chat <laughs> A lot of speculation and a lot of well, they have a, they have a secret method by which to do this, which is the big which is a big red flag for me. They're like, oh, they're not even showing their work. This isn't really anything to be worried about. This is probably just like random eugenicists or eugenics um, adjacent people in South Africa writing regulation in the hopes of future eugenics. If it's even that. <laughs> uh, anyway, we're gonna move. I will say some of like the the news targeted uh, either targeted at international audiences or targeted to Americans where it's aesthetically where it looks aesthetically like it is a targeted at international audiences some of that misinformation is of a pretty low quality <laughs> I'm not saying you know I guess that's good we'll take the small victories where we can get them but seems like it's low quality misinformation here i could have done a better job like making misinformation about that i never would i would have huge ethical problems with that but i could have done a better job making misinformation about that now we're going to learn something good about something happening that probably is actually really actually really happening this is um it's a story about finland and uh it looks like pretty young kids are being taught media literacy there and that's pretty fucking cool <laughs> To say that Finland values education is an okay. understatement. No, that's not Finnish they're speaking. What's well, Spanish? This is a Spanish class at a public elementary school in the capital Helsinki. And yet their language proficient. I could sound like it's scolding me. The only thing that makes these fourth grade Finns so remarkable. Information falsa. At just 10 years old, they're already learning to separate fact Can you figure out which is the fake news? from fiction. Today's assignment? Let's find out if an alien really did land on Earth in the past decade. For 
Oh, I hope so. Yep, they also... Look at the fins. The fins look at this. They're hella smart. They're using ThinkPads. Ugh, could be running Linux, but not bad. Ever somebody who's so seen an alien, so like it's already fake because it says that it was 10 years ago in 2013 and still nobody has seen aliens ever. Mm, so you <laughs> oh my god, the kid's doing this in English too. Years ago, you probably would have heard about an alien. Yes. These kids are already pros. They've been at it since they were six. And they'll keep sharpening their ability to spot hoaxes, avoid scams, and debunk propaganda throughout their education. Just like every child in Finland. Lee Anderson is the former education minister. I think it should be seen as a civic skill in the, the current society that we live in. Because we all live in an information society nowadays, or it's called an information society, right? But actually, um, some of the information is mis- or disinformation. For this small Nordic nation of just five and a half million, rooting out misinformation is a civic skill born of necessity. Over the years, Finland has found itself the target of fake news campaigns by a longtime foe, Russia. A few examples. Pro-Russian trolls circulating videos and making debunked claims of Finnish tanks mobilizing at the Russian border. In reality, they were heading to a training exercise in the opposite direction. <laughs> the same Russian media has been stoking anti-migrant sentiment in Finland. Finnish cities will be surrounded by a ring of burning ghettos. Fueling protests and violence against refugees. The misinformation war has Finns worried about the powerful neighbor with whom they share an 800-mile-long border. After all, Finns have seen how Russia has treated another neighbor, Ukraine. Last year, Finland joined NATO, and they're building a wall along the border with Russia. But it's this fake news firewall. For example, the Russian news site. Does anyone have anything on, on that? they're counting on to safeguard this or any country's most precious resource, the truth. Uh, Economist, New York Times. Media literacy, as it's called, is woven into every class, like high school English with Mrs. Terhi Korpola. Then I also provided you with um, fake news sites, as they call them. Here, they learn to spot the red flags. Uh, this article says that Facebook's AI chat uh, backs up the claim that uh, 2020 president election was rigged. Uh, and instead of the current president, Joe Biden, the real winner was actually Donald Trump. Then back up their reasoning. I'm very critical about this article and the whole site. Uh, the Gateway Pundit is far right side and uh, it's known for being biased. Also, that's Jim Hoft. If you look for the stupidest man on the internet, I think the Jim Hoft that runs the Gateway Pundit still comes up as the first a whole page of results. Publishing fake news. Zamza Muhammad grew up going to American schools abroad. Were you, were you taught to identify fake news? Not really. It was only here when I started to like get that, you know. I used to have questions, but every time I would ask them, the teacher or anybody else would be like, no, this is the way it is, like this is it's written here. But only here now that I've come here, I'm able to like question things a lot. So critical thinking yes. is a real priority here. It's a huge priority here. One that gives English teacher Terhi Korpel a hope for the future. I have to say, I was very impressed. Good, good to hear, yeah. I wish more adults were capable of doing what these kids are doing. Yeah, I wish the exact same thing. I sometimes at home, I, we know, I have discussions with my husband uh, and they, they are not as sort of civilized as, as the youngsters. <laughs> <laughs> By She's cool. Every global standard, Finland ranks near the top in education. But when it comes to resilience against false information, Finland is the top, first out of 41 European countries, according to a recent survey. Educators credit... I don't know how you measure that. ...the moment they enter public school, when their lives still revolve around fairy tales and playing pretend. Sana Lindau teaches kindergarten. These are kids who still believe in the Easter Bunny and in Santa Claus. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. <laughs> You're not telling them that's fake news, are you? <laughs> Well, I think that with the Santa Claus, I leave it to the parents. We <laughs> act together or we, we play, we draw. We, we can live in the fantasy world as well, of course. Ah. 
So, so you, there is a place for fantasy. Yeah, 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 of course. But there's also a place to start familiarizing children with the differences between advertisements and stories, poems and publicity, she says. All while teaching the country's youngest how to navigate and understand the internet. Former education minister Lee Anderson. You start from preschool. I think, as I said, it's more about familiarizing children also with what the digital world is to make sure that all children have a sufficient set of digital skills. And on top of that, you also have to teach them how to um, act in the di digitalized world, how to interpret different type of text and so on. It's a skill, she insists, that's not only central to Finland's education system, it's central to Finland's democracy. I guess for me, the big question is, what's at stake? I mean, what happens if kids... Yeah, this interview does kind of suck. ...and they can't identify <clears throat> the difference between fake news and legitimate news. If that happens, I think it makes our societies very vulnerable. I think it will also polarize political discussion. Um, there is a saying in Finnish, you have the right to your own opinion, but you do not have the right to your own facts. Right on. That was that could have been a much better segment. It wasn't a bad segment, but I think chat was right. I think the interviewer wasn't very good. Like it would have been nice if it was like a disinformation reporter from like one of the one of the outlets and not like it seemed like he was a human interest style a reporter. That's fine. Human interest stories are of interest to humans and whatnot, but I don't think that was the the right the right um right person for that. We're going to move on to our uh, wingnut segment of the show. Uh, we got Lance Walnu has some uh, thoughts about the election. We haven't done a lot of Lance Walnu lately. He's been back like on the on the docket the last couple months, though. I think he, uh, I don't know, maybe he hid somewhere. It says in chapter eleven, verse one. Okay. I, Gabriel, the archangel, stood by Darius. Darius to confirm him in the first year of his administration. That meant God sent an archangel to do warfare to get the right person in office in the first 12 months. What? What's interesting is Cyrus is mm -hmm. the one who's being talked about in chapter 10, and suddenly it's Darius yes, there's in a switch. chapter 11. Mm -hmm. but here's what Mario Bramnick said, who was at the meeting, who works with the Trump team. He said, Donald Trump was Cyrus 45. But when he comes back in, he's not Isaiah, he's not he's no longer the 45th president. He's what is he going to be the 47th president? Mm -hmm. So the 45th, 46th, 47th. Yes. So he's coming in as 47. 47 is going to be Darius. What? So he goes in as Cyrus, but he comes back as Darius. Mm -hmm. I don't know what any of this means. In that context, we have a battle to get him in. I don't think we, we need to know what any of this means. Push it over the finish line. And then we have the first finish, you say, administration is supernatural, angelic reinforcement. <laughs> All right. I don't know what most of that means, but fucking cool, man. Fucking cool. Uh, Lance Walno also has some ideas about, um, well, about flying coach. The fucking the struggle is real, friends. The struggle is fucking real. I want you to become a partner with this ministry. I don't push this a lot. I don't bring it up a lot. Jesse Duplantis told me the other day has 400,000 partners, and I began to have partner envy. Uh, Kenneth Copeland has hundreds of thousands of partners. And of course, then, then you wonder when they've got $80 million budgets and they could fly around the world. And, and I, was, I know there's all this anger at these uh, prosperity preachers, but I'm telling you something. When I'm stuck in two or three planes and can't get somewhere and I'm schlepping my luggage along and I'm... Does he mean like air travel? Like the way that most of us have experienced air travel? bouncing around in this little cabin and I'm supposed to come refreshed and I'm 69 years old giving a word. It's not the same as when I get on one of these planes, which is chartered, which my wealthier friends have and fly in and fly out and don't even have to go jostling through the daily grope, you know, and having to get your TSA <laughs> and be lectured. Oh, this guy's hella mad that he's not fucking, he's, he's like, he's like, I am not grifting enough. Can you help me grift more? Imagine having grift envy. 
because that's what we watch. We watch that dude to hell mad that other people are grifting. By the way, I think he mentioned Kenneth Copeland um, in his a little grift envy little talk there. Well, Kenneth Copeland going to chime in too. I got we got two clips of uh, Mr. Copeland here. Um, Have to pardon me here. This this the system isn't laid out in a way that I'm used to, but we're we're getting there. We're getting there. We're going to get through it tonight. Here's Mr. Copeland. I'm going to move in a great. Oh, that's not Mr. Copeland. Mr. Copeland's standing there with the star spangled awesome fucking tie. To call this nation back to myself. I believe it's here right now. It's here right now. The awakening we've been praying, believing for. It started right there at Asbury. Like hate Ashbury. But now the atmosphere has been cleansed. Yes, thank you. <laughs> oh, put out your greasy hand. Has been cleansed. No more rainbow flags. Why not? There's plenty of them where I'm at. And the spirit of Margaret Sanger mm. is gone. Oh, Margaret Sanger. I think that's a. a is that an abort? That's an abortion activist, right? Was Margaret Sanger a fucking suffragette? I forget which. I mean, it could be both, I suppose. The spirit of Margaret Sanger. I don't even remember the last time I thought of Margaret Sanger. Does anybody here remember the last time they talk about Margaret Sanger? Oh, it was Planned Parenthood. I'm hearing from the chat. That's why I have chat. Um, I mean, they give me money, but also they're, they know more things than I do. Because even when there's not a giant pile of them, there's certainly more of them than there are of me. Here's more from Kenneth Copeland. It appears like it's from maybe the same event. I saw this in the spirit. Literally. Judgment day. And Jesus stood there. It's a big red flag when somebody says Jesus like that. It's all it's like a big red flag, at least if it's a white dude, like old white dude says Jesus that way. A big red flag. And he said, those of you that didn't vote, I put you in that nation and you didn't vote. Uh -huh. So you will hear or you didn't pray and vote like I told you to. What? You will listen to the names of all the babies that are here and never got any life. Well, are they here? Uh, the fucking ghosts? And it'll take a while because there's over 65 million of them. But you are going to listen to... What if they would all been liberals? And you are going to be held responsible for their death. Yes. Well, that's wild. Did anybody remember? Remember when he had that fucking... like? It was during fucking COVID when he had the fucking... It appeared that his hand was like covered in lube or something. Does anybody remember this? I think he should cover his hand in lube again. So it's at least more fun. All right, we got one more clip before we go into red light. The uh, docket part of the show was uh, short again this week. Um, but things are weird. Here's a Christian nationalist, Doug uh, Wilson, who I'm not sure we've done any content on. It's mad that you or someone like you might have orgasms without consequences. So it is manifest and plain that God is currently judging America, one of the most fruitful nations ever to exist. And he is just Lots of gays. He's turning right. us over to the fruitless deeds of darkness. He is letting us run headlong into the void where no fruit grows, where no harvest has ever... Into the void where there are no fruit. Fruitless. Pay attention to that italicized adjective, fruitless. What is anal intercourse? Whoa! Things, fruitless. What do puberty blockers bring about? Fruitlessness. What is abortion? Violent and bloody fruitlessness. Fruitless. What is a dink, double income, no kids, <laughs> lifestyle. Fruitless. A dink, fruitless, America fruitless dinks. You enslaved yourself to the terrible bondage of orgasms without consequences. Under the weight of this severe judgment, we have demanded as our constitutional prerogative the right to become as fruitless as a dried out stick. It is our Wait, what? right <laughs> as a dried out stick to be struck in the forehead with the hammer of God. <laughs> Everybody do not become as fruitless as a dried out stick. I don't know what the fuck it means, but do not become as fruitless as a dried out stick. 
I wonder if he thinks that that was like a turn of phrase, right? That he's like, oh, I have, I've got to use this turn of phrase tonight on my show. I bet he did. I bet he thought that was some kind of turn of phrase. Things aren't great. It's getting, uh, the, the news cycle is completely um, dominated by stuff about stuff about the, the election and Trump. And that's like generally, even for the Sunday show, it's mostly media analysis. And we don't generally talk about that stuff that much. So it's a little bit, a little bit hard to uh, find stuff to cover on this show and not just fucking doom and gloom about the, uh, the or continuously unfolding dystopia. If I want to doom and gloom about our continuously unfolding dystopia, I'd like to do it on the Odyssey website where people think the EMP is going to, uh, destroy your electric cars or something like that. That's the kind of doom and gloom I'm here for this fucking this who won the election doom and gloom. Not my favorite shit in the world. So I guess that's the podcast part of the show. Um, thanks everybody for hanging out for that. Um, if you're listening to this on Spotify, Apple podcasts, etc., you should check the live show out sometime. That's twitch.tv slash echoplex media. We're live generally six nights a week. And um, if you don't want to do all that and you want the show anyway, you can go to patreon.com slash echoplex or eplex.store, sign up at the $5 level or higher, and um, get yourself the show sent to your inbox the very next day after it was recorded, most of the time. And uh, we're going to go into red light. I'm going to pour myself a cocktail. And um, we have a bunch of more uh, crazy shit. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out tonight. And uh, we'll be right back. This is Boomers by Periscope.